Let me start recording. Great. Morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. I hope you had a good week without lab. And today we're going over lab seven, conductivity, salinity, and desalination. So conductivity, something that we can directly measure um, using a probe. Salinity is how salty something is. Um, we can't directly measure this, but we can calculate this using our conductivity numbers. And desalination is basically the process of taking pure water out from salt water or seawater. And we'll go over how that all relates to each other. These are more water quality parameters that we're going over today. So the lab outline for today is that we're going to first go over the introduction of salinity, conductivity, and desalination of water resources. Then we're going to watch a desalination video. Um, how would you desalinate or distill um, pure water out of seawater in lab? And that would relate to how would it look like in a water plant? How would we do that? Like the basic concepts like relate to each other um, from how you would do it in lab and how you would do it in a water plant. So um, we'll just watch that video. And then I'm going to go over the overview of the data sheet and post lab questions, which are on Canvas, uh, the lab, lab seven uh, Canvas page. And you'll be turning that in, um, but it won't be due until like next week, basically. But those are, we'll I'll go over later. So first, if we are going to talk about conductivity and salinity. So conductivity is the ability of an aqueous solution to conduct an electrical current. This means this is measured in units of Siemens or capital S. And this is something you can directly measure using a probe and it's dependent upon the amount of ions in a solution. So if we're looking at salt water, seawater, um, it's the amount of dissolved salts. Uh, those are the ions that we're measuring um, to get our conductivity number. And salinity refers to the concentration of dissolved salts in an aqueous solution. So how salty is your solution? It's measured in parts per thousand PPT, or it looks like this unit, like a percent symbol with an extra zero at the end. And it's an indirect measurement. You can't directly measure it. It's calculated from our conductivity value. So salinity of various ecosystems, they um, are different. So it depends upon, are you looking at a freshwater stream? Are you testing the ocean water? Are you testing maybe a mix of both? So um, we can categorize different salinity types um, or the different salinity levels of waters um, based off of their levels, even their PPTs. So for freshwater, um, we would say that the freshwater has a salinity of less than 0 0.5 PPTs. And this is actually the number, um, the US public health standard of water that's safe for us to drink. And anything lower than this level is safe for us to drink. Anything over, you can drink, it's not good for you, but this is the salinity level for that. Seawater or saline water is um, 35 PPTs. This is actually, the global um, average uh, salinity level for seawater. And it's going to be around 35 PPT and anything a mix between or anything between 0 0.5 to 30 PPTs is brackish water. So this mix where it's not, um, salinity levels isn't as low as fresh water, as pure water, um, but it's not as salty as seawater. And anything over 40 PPTs is brine. So um, you would most of the time get brine if you're doing a desalination process where you're taking like pure water out and leaving behind super salty, um, yeah, leftover hypersaline water. But now if we're going to look at more specifically the Bay Area, um, we see that this is this is San Francisco here, we have our ocean. And now we're just going to look at the water in the Bay. So up um, inland, there's the, we have Central Valley, we have Sacramento River, the San Joaquin River, and this mixing of fresh water from um, inland is going to come down and mix with the water that we get from the ocean, so our hypersaline seawater. And you see this change in color, this um, actually is brackish water. So that's why in Ocean Beach, this um, the Ocean Beach has brackish water where it's not as salty as regular seawater, but it's not as um, low in salinity as fresh water. So this is an example that we can see right in the bay. And this is an example of brackish water. 
So if we are going to do desalination or taking out pure water from seawater, we can do this through distillation. In lab, this is one way that you can do it where we first have our hot plate. Uh, and on top of that, we have our Erlenmeyer flask holding seawater and a couple of boiling chips. They're like little pebbles that you put in to your Erlenmeyer flask and it uh, helps your solution boil. Um, your flask is held in place with a clamp and a stopper, which connects uh, your glass tubing or rubber tubing with to your collection vial, which is held inside, um, which is held, yeah, inside of a beaker with tap water or an ice bath. And basically, your hot plate would boil your seawater and your pure water would evaporate into your glass tubing and it would recondense in your collection vial where um, either the ice bath or um, a beaker with tap water would just have it, uh, yeah, collect again at the bottom here. So one thing in lab that we would wanna make sure is that the glass tube is not too close to distillate. So this glass tube isn't too close to the bottom of the collection vial. Um, just because this whole process of um, distilling, boiling your water, getting it to recondense in the vial takes around 20, 30 minutes and we wouldn't want your uh, glass tubing to be too close to the bottom because then it would create a vacuum and it would suck up all of the water that you've waited 20, 30 minutes for. And it makes a loud noise, which isn't dangerous, but it could be scary. But that's one thing in lab we would wanna make sure that this isn't too close to the bottom, too close to the distillate. So what do we have after distillation? So before distillation, we have our Erlenmeyer flask with our seawater uh, salinity, average global seawater salinity levels is 35 PBTs. And we don't have anything in our collection vial because we nothing got to recondense. So, but after distillation, we have um, our Erlenmeyer flask, but now all of the pure H2O, pure water evaporated out, most all of it. And we have brine, which is now super saline more, um, the salinity levels is higher than 35 PPTs. And our distillate is in our collection vial, which is our pure H2O, pure water with a salinity of zero PPTs. If your collection vial is clean, then it should be a salinity of zero. Um, so after this, after distillation, we have our brine, which is hyper saline, super salty and fresh water. So this is a video on what it would look like if we um, if we were to do this in lab, and it's a little bit different the, than the regular setup in um, the USF labs, but only in minor things where they are using uh, a Bunsen burner. We would have used a hot plate and some things with units, but overall the concepts are pretty much the same. So we can watch this together. Over 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. But most of that water is salt water in the oceans. Only a very small amount of that water is actually fresh water, and most of the fresh water is locked up as glaciers. And some of it's in our lakes. And only a very small amount is in our streams and in groundwater. And that's the water that we rely upon as drinking water. The leading cause of death of children in the world is lack of clean water. So can we take salt water and turn it into fresh water? That's the purpose or objective of this lab, to take salt water and run it through a process called distillation and distill it into fresh water. The process of distillation is very energy intense. We're going to need a Bunsen burner for this lab. We're going to need, obviously, a lighter to start the Bunsen burner. You'll need a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask with a rubber stopper and a tube coming out of it that's going to collect the steam and you're going to need a test tube in order to condense the steam into liquid water. You'll need a 600 milliliter beaker, some ice, a couple boiling chips or rocks, LabQuest device, and a conductivity probe to measure how much salt is in the water. And of course you'll need salt water in order to run this experiment as well. To your 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, go ahead and add 
a small handful of rocks. And those are going to be boiling chips that are going to allow the salt water to boil at a normal amount without overboiling. To the Erlenmeyer flask, also add 100 milliliters of salt water. Replace the cap on the Erlenmeyer flask. Make sure that the tube, the rubber tube, is going to travel continuously down without having a bend or a kink in it where the water can start to build up. That can be kind of dangerous, so make sure it's a normal line going all the way down into a test tube, which is in, and this test tube has to be extremely clean because you're going to be collecting clean, pure distilled water. So make sure that this is very clean. If not, make sure to rinse it out a bunch of times with distilled water and collect it in a 600 milliliter beaker that contains an ice water bath. So this beaker should contain ice and water to make an ice water bath. Okay, so there's your ice water bath. Go ahead and put the test tube in the ice water bath. Before you start the experiment, you're going to want to measure how much salt is in that water. I made up the salt water to contain 8 grams per liter. Now let's use our conductivity probe to measure and see how much exactly is in there. Plug your conductivity probe into the LabQuest device. Over a towel, rinse the conductivity probe with distilled water. The tip of the conductivity probe, the very end of it. Rinse it with distilled water. Only ever use distilled water. If the distilled water ever runs out, make sure to only fill it up using the distilled water in this container and not to fill it up from the sink so that these always only contain distilled water, purified water. Place the rinsed conductivity probe directly into the salt water. Make sure that the tip of the temperature uh, conductivity probe is completely submerged. Right now it's not, so what I need to do is tilt this a little bit so that the conductivity probe is completely submerged. Make sure the toggle switch on the conductivity probe is on the 0 to 20,000 reading. This is because we're measuring salt water and salt water is going to have a high reading. So we're not going to use either the lower readings, we'll use the highest reading. On the LabQuest, change the units to milligrams per liter. Change the units to milligrams per liter. I said before that I made this salt water as a 8 grams per liter. That would be 8,000 milligrams per liter. This is reading 7,215. That's probably pretty accurate. Simply record the live readout in your data table. So I would write 7215 milligrams per liter in my data table. You do not need to connect your iPad to the LabQuest for this experiment. Carefully remove the conductivity probe from the salt water. Over a towel, rinse the salt water off the conductivity probe using distilled water. Set the LabQuest aside. You won't need it until you've completed the experiment. Reset your Erlenmeyer flask. Put the cover back on. Put on a sweet pair of goggles. Now it's time to light and adjust your Bunsen burner. So the first thing you want to do is connect the Bunsen burner tube to the gas. Turn the valve on. Go ahead and light your Bunsen burner. So this flame looks pretty good, but I'm going to show you how to make a couple adjustments in case it doesn't look so good when you first turn it on. Um, first of all, I'll show you that there's two adjustable things you can do. One is that you can turn this, and by turning that, it's going to reduce or increase the amount of oxygen that's going into this thing. All right, so if you find a really orange flame, that's, this is what you need to adjust. 
You need to adjust the base here. Get it back down so you have basically a flame within a flame. You've got the inner blue flame and the outer blue flame and should be about a one inch flame there and about a two and a half inch flame there. If you're not getting enough flame, you can do one of two things. You can make this adjustment on the base here. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's reducing how much gas is coming out. By increasing this, you're increasing how much gas is going through and that's way too much. Um, again, you just want kind of a normal flame there. So again, that looks pretty good. I'm going to be happy with that. Just wanted to show you some adjustments quick on the Bunsen burner. Go ahead and begin heating your salt water. Making sure that everything looks good. Okay, this tube should be going all the way down without any kinks in it, all the way into your clean collection test tube, which is in the ice water bath. You want kind of a nice medium controlled flame so that things don't get out of hand. If they do get out of hand and this boils over too much, um, you're going to contaminate your test tube and what you're going to want to do right away is if, if things get out of hand too quick, the first thing to do is probably just to move the Bunsen burner out from underneath the flask. Then obviously then you can start taking time and making adjustments on the flame. So things are going pretty well. I've got a pretty good rolling boil here. Um, just be careful that you don't want it to boil all the way up to the rubber stopper or you're going to start to get salt water in there. So again, you can, you can make some minor adjustments on the flame to make sure to keep it down um, so that you're not going to get too hot of a boil, um, just a normal boil. You can see this is, I'm kind of zooming in on the test tube inside the, the beaker that you can see that the level is rising. I'm collecting distilled water as it boils here slowly, but I, fast enough that you can observe it happening here and we're condensing the steam into into water here in the ice water bath. Again just be very careful this is a potentially dangerous situation so please just don't sit on your iPad and play games obviously you never want to do that but this is this is something you need to keep an eye on here this is we got very hot steam we've got boiling water here we've got a potential uh, pressure situation if this gets backed up so just make sure you're monitoring this the entire time it's happening. When it looks like you've got enough distilled water collected in your test tube, go ahead and shut off the flame by turning the valve off. Don't just blow it out here, the gas will still come out. Now what we really want to do is get a reading on what's the uh, conductivity of the distilled water. So again, don't, you might burn yourself if you grab that, just be careful. And we want this to be in room temperature water, not ice water, so I grabbed another beaker. I'm going to fill that up with carefully so that you don't burn yourself. Transfer your distilled water into that room temperature water. When a few minutes have gone by, place the conductivity probe inside the distilled water test tube. Since we're reading distilled water, you really need to change this setting. Okay, so this should no longer be zero to 20,000. We're checking distilled water. That's probably gonna be a pretty small amount of salt in there. I'd probably change it to the lowest setting, which is zero to 200 for this reading. Make sure that your units are in milligrams per liter and I'm now reading 11.5 milligrams per liter where we're reading in the 7,000s before. So yeah, we definitely purified and distilled the water, the salt water, and obtained some very fresh, pure distilled water. Clean up, make sure to rinse off your conductivity probe one more time and dry it off before you put it away. Like always, rinse out test tubes and beakers. I just recommend at least rinsing them thoroughly five times to make sure you get any salt or anything like that off of them. Certainly allow your Erlenmeyer flask to cool for a long time before you touch it. Please take your time cleaning up lab equipment, rinsing off glassware, and spraying off your table. Thanks. Great, so this um, video was Pretty good example of how the, the basic concepts of how to um, do distillation and desalination of ocean water. Um, there are a couple of differences. Usually um, in a USF lab, we would use hot plates instead and the units that he was using in milligrams per liter, it's it's totally fine, it's perfectly fine. But I think um, you know we can also just put that in micro siemens and that's also a good unit that we're gonna be using in the data today. So. Um, that's like the one difference in units and I guess because they also have iPads and we don't, but that's a uh, little differences and I feel that overall the concepts are the same. So 
now that we saw desalination, um, is desalination the answer to drought? If we can take out pure water from seawater or salty water, why don't we do that and give it to people who need it? So there are um, plans for desalination plants in California, and there actually is a desalination plant that exists in San Diego, but um, why, why wouldn't we want to do des desalination to get our water? So I guess we can start by looking at the desalination process. So if we're looking at a desalination plant, first we have our seawater, it's going to go through pretreatment. So in pretreatment, that's when the um, bigger particles, bigger um, sediments, bacteria, and everything is taken out as much as possible, taken out and then from our water and then sent to a landfill. And that water would be then um, sent to our desalination step. So in this desalination step, what happens is that this water is forced through um, several filters, several different filters. It uses the process of reverse osmosis and basically takes almost all of the salts from seawater. And um, at the end, um, we have brine, um, just like how we saw in the distillation process in lab, there is brine that comes out in fresh water. And when we have, um, now that we have our brine, we can't, because brine is this hypersaline, super salty solution, we can't um, just release it back into the ocean or wherever as is in its original form, we would either, um, if you mix it in with wastewater, you would have to send it through another treatment process. If you mix it in with ocean water, then you can send it back to seawater, but we can't send um, brine in this super saline, super salty state back as is. Um, but once we have fresh water, it's going to go through post-treatment. Uh, post-treatment is when, um, Water is chlorinated. So in the previous steps, minerals and ions, they're taken out and um, yeah, they're taken out of the water, but now you're gonna add them back in because it's, uh, you can drink um, water without ions in it, but it's not uh, super healthy for you to drink in the long term because you need nutrients and ions in your water. And so that's when all of the, when the minerals that were taken out before you're gonna add them back in for taste or for nutrients. And um, in post-treatment, you can also, the, another step could be like UV treatment or uh, something to just treat your water before you store it and you deliver it to people who need it. So distillation, it's, we saw as the process of separating water from salts by boiling point. So after we evaporate, um, after we boil our seawater, salty water, Pure water is gonna evaporate and then recondense as, um, as a form of water that we can use. So some pros to distillation, if we, we have a lot of water, like seawater, um, if you're near a coast, there's a lot of seawater for you to use and to do this distillation process with. And it's a relatively straightforward concept. We're basically just taking pure water from seawater and that's the whole concept behind it. Some cons, is that this is really only limited to coastal areas. If you're too far inland, it's not, um, this isn't really a viable option. It does take up a lot of space. So the process that we saw in the last slide, um, a desalination plant, all of those different parts would take up a lot of space and it also takes up a lot of energy too. So instead of treating regular wastewater, uh, regular catchment water, like rainwater, um, if we were to treat, uh, seawater and do the desalination process, it takes 200,000 times the energy. And also at the end of the desalination process, it produces a lot of brine. So that hypersaline super salty solution, which impacts ecosystems. So we would have to either treat it again with regular, mixed with regular wastewater or mix it in with ocean water before we can send it back to the ocean. Now, why are ions important in drinking water? If we already, in the couple of steps before the desalination or the post-treatment process, we took out a lot of ions and minerals. So why would we wanna add them back in when we already took them out? So it's actually not healthy to drink deionized water without ions. Um, your body does need ions and um, electrolytes to 
do certain functions like conducting energy, transporting nutrients, um, supporting mental function, converting calories into energy, and more. So you can drink deionized water, just but not for a long time. And that's why if you look at um, bottled water, sometimes on the label, it says uh, nutrients added back for taste, or you there's that's why there's like that nutrient label on bottled water when you would think like why is there a nutrient label if it's just water well that's because there's um other um nutrients and ions that are added back in so yeah we need ions in our drinking water so if we do need ions in our drinking water but we can't directly drink seawater how can seagulls drink seawater so there are a handful of land terrestrial animals that can drink seawater and the seagull is one of them if um so they basically evolved to be able to drink seawater they um when they drink seawater they collect the salt in a gland above their eye and when it's full they would just shake their head and the salt would just excrete out. So a couple of land, like land animals can drink seawater. Another one of them is um, this iguana in the Galapagos where um, they'll drink seawater and they'll just sneeze out the salt. So it's, yeah, it is possible for land animals. And this is, uh, I guess, in um, terrestrial animals, this is the process of desalination for them. But now if we, go into our Canvas page, we can start looking at the um, data that we'll be using. So if you go to lab seven on the Canvas page, we have this desalination, um, that video that we saw, and it's available here. And right underneath it, we have our lab seven assignment data and questions handout. And this basically, this has the data that we're going to be working with. And we're given two tables. Table one um, has the conductivity, salinity, and temperature of seawater um, before and after the distillation process. So that lab video that we saw, this is, um, this is, this is data that's been collected in the past uh, uh, ENVS 100 lab, where we have seawater before distillation and the salinity in PPTs is 27.2. And um, well, you might be wondering why isn't it 35 um, parts per thousand if that's the regular um, salinity levels of ocean water. So this seawater is actually from, um, our sample is from uh, Ocean Beach where there's that mix between fresh water coming in from Central Valley and um, from the Sacramento River mixing in with the um, regular ocean water. So this is, Ocean Beach has brackish water, and that's why the salinity levels isn't as low as fresh water, but it's not as high as regular ocean water. And then um, next we have our distillate. So that pure water after our um, desalination process. So the salinity for that is zero PPTs. And our brine, which is left over in our Erlenmeyer flask at the end, where all of the water is evaporated out. And at the end, it's that super saline, super salty water. Um, and the salinity is a lot higher afterwards because all the salts are left over in the flask and the salinity level for that is 39.1 PPTs. In the next column over, we also have conductivity and then we have temperature. So this is table one. For table two, we have the temperature, conductivity and salinity of different sample types. So we have seawater in Ocean Beach. Um, we have lake water from Lake Merced, tap water, and deionized water. So deionized water is um, water where most of the particles and most of the ions and everything has been taken out. Um, you can make deionized water in lab using a machine and it's pretty useful for a lot of different things like uh, washing out your lab equipment or rinsing out your test tubes um, or setting standards in a couple, uh, I think like in one or two labs before we actually use deionized water as one of the samples to set standards. And that's 
here and we have our salinity in this column in PPTs and conductivity and temperature. So this is table two. Now, if we, um, using these two tables, we can answer the assignment questions on the next page. Um, so for this very first question, in your own words, describe a couple of sentences the distillation procedure you use. This is um, referring to that video that we saw on desalination distillation where we would have um, the Bunsen burner and like our Erlenmeyer flask and our collection files, all of that. So you would write maybe like a short paragraph or a couple of sentences on the materials involved. What would you get at the end? What do you have in the beginning? Things like that. So for question two, is there a difference in salinity between tap water and deionized water? Calculate the difference using the data that was gathered. So short answer, is there a difference in salinity between tap water and deionized water? Yes, um, we can see that if we look at table two. So table two, if our salinity, this is our column for salinity, tap water, deionized water. Deionized water has a salinity of 0, 0.0 PPTs. Tap water is 0 0.04 PPTs. And to calculate the difference, you would just subtract them. And the same concept uh, can be used for question three, where is there a difference between conductivity between tap water and deionized water? You would again refer to table two. And if there is a difference, you would calculate it by subtracting again. Uh, for question four, how does your measured salinity for ocean beach water compare with the global average value for seawater, where salinity is 35 PPTs? Explain why there's a difference if one is observed. So is ocean beach water um, around the same, lower or higher in salinity? And if there is a difference, just explain why. For question five, comment on the drinkability of the water you obtained by distillation with respect to salinity by comparing it to the US Public Health Service standard of 0 0.5 PPTs. This is referring to table one, the um, distillation process, where we're looking at the distillate or the pure water that we got at the end. And looking at the salinity level for that is um, comparing it to the Public Health Service standard of 0 0.5 PPTs. Is it drinkable? And for question six, what is the salinity of the water remaining in the flask at the end of the distillation? Is it different from the initial salinity of seawater? Calculate the difference using the data that you gathered. So this is again referring to table one where um, the salinity of the water remaining in the flask is the brine left over in your Erlenmeyer flask and you would compare that salinity level to the initial salinity level of the seawater before you boiled it. And more subtracting. But that is um, all the questions that you have to answer. You would type this up in a Word doc, um, in a separate Word doc, or just download this and like answer it on this Word doc, and then turn it into Canvas. But that is um, basically what you have to do for the lab seven assignment. Did anybody have any questions? Yeah, I had a question. Sure. Um, could you talk about question six again? When, what are we doing the difference of for that one? Sure. Um, question six, what is the salinity of the water remaining in the flask at the end of the distillation? So mm -hmm. this is um, referring to table one where the water remaining in the flask is our brine where all of the water that was evaporated out. Mm -hmm. um, we're just le it leaves behind the super salty, super saline solution. So yeah. this is a uh, the brine, and we're just comparing it to the seawater before distillation. So our seawater okay. here, yeah, and just difference in salinity between those two. Sounds good. Okay. Did anybody else have any other questions? If not, then that is basically the end of lab. And um, this isn't due until next week before lab. So 
you know, ask any questions, email me if anything comes up, but I hope you have a good rest of your day. I hope you have a good rest of your week and I'll see you all next week. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Maggie. Uh, I have a question. Sure. 